Well, welcome everyone to this um, Kingdom Finance War Room session, 26 July, 2024. Uh, really uh, glad to be with everybody that can be, join me live. And for those of you, you joining in on one of the various sites, Rumble or YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, welcome as well. And uh, please connect with us. If you are listening in on those places, you can join with us on uh, www.thewar or pardon me the 7000.com and look in the blog section there you'll see lots of uh, other materials as we develop that site there'll be more interaction there as well so please uh, feel free to do that today we're going to talk about exactly that the kingdom finance revolution and what the kingdom finance revolution is and what the direction of travel is and why it's all about. Now, of course, those of you that have tracked with me for a while, you know the Kingdom Finance Revolution is the title of the book that's being published in um, September. Now, that's the current scheduled date. And um, and that's going to be coming out. And we've talked about that. Many of you have taken a course in relation to that, which is available. But what I wanted to do is to go back and take a look at that in terms of looking at it in one session, a, a genesis of what it is all about. Not so much the 7,000 vision of what we'd like to do, you know, projects development and giving and think tank and all, not, not that side of things so much in this session, but just drill down into why we're doing what we're doing, what the flow of the book is all about and where we're going, what it means for us. What does it mean? And where does this all drive from? This derives from a real revelation of what kingdom finance versus Christian business is all about. Christian business, all good. Don't let me say anything's wrong. You're, the better you can do things, the more excellence you can bring to things. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, but, you know, simply having Christian music playing in the lobby and some nice little sayings around doesn't mean that you've created a transformative culture or transformative business, right? We're looking for something that's more fundamental. And one of the things that really drew me in and I think uh, um, draws us all together is the calling of 1 John 3, 8, which is to partner with Jesus in his mission to destroy the works of devil, of the devil. So that brings a couple of things to mind. One, we have to know what the evil is. What, what, what is the devil? What are his works? We got to know, we got to be clear about that. And half the time, I think in the church and in Ecclesia, you're talking to, they're not really sure whether we should be talking about politics. They're not really sure about the entire agenda that's being pushed by many people in culture. They're not sure about these things left, right, and center. So, so there's variety in there. No, we have to be have, a, have an understanding of what the works of the devil are. And part of that that we go into uh, in the book in detail is we can't ascribe to God the works of Satan. Satan's works are very clear to steal, kill, and destroy. If there's stealing in your life, if there's killing in your life, is there, if there's destroying in your life, then trace back the plug to the wall, you'll find that Satan's at the core of that, core of all of that. We can't attribute it to God. If we're pleading with God to stop inflicting this wound upon us, the, that's kind of a wasted thing. One, he's not inflicting the wound so he can't start. And two, you're attributing to God the works of Satan. That isn't to say there isn't the kind of thing where God chastises us and he, he challenges us and we can be, be convicted of sin. No, I'm talking about the separation of those things into attributing to, to God the works of Satan. We have to be very clear on that front. At the core of the kingdom finance revolution is a fundamental vision of who we are and where we're going. You've heard me say this truism a great many times. If you want to start on a journey, it doesn't matter where you're going, but you have to start where you are. There's no good saying, oh, I wish I was where so-and-so was. I'm going to start from there. Well, you're not there. You have to start where you are. God deals with us where we are. If you came to Christ in a bar with your life in ruins, that's where you are. That's where you start from. Immediately upon salvation, you may be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, you may have access to all kinds of miraculous work in your life, but you start from where you are. If you're divorced before you get saved, you'll be divorced after you get saved. If you're divorced today, you'll be divorced tomorrow. The question is, is that going to be the definition of who you are and where you're going and what you're doing? 
So we start with Isaiah 61. I want to just spend, normally I just gloss over that. I want to go through that in a little bit more detail. I'm going to read it to you, Isaiah 61. Follow along if you have a scripture. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So what is this good news? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, those, those that are enslaved, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve, to bestow on them the crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Right, So that's what I call the first half of this Isaiah 61 revelation. Why do I call it the first half of the revelation? Because that's the revelation of Jesus that he attributed to himself and said that that is his mission, his ministry. When we come into Christ, we accept the forgiveness of sins through his blood. We go into a divine exchange where we become transformed. And that's in the kingdom finance revolution. Once we finish this little intro, that's where we're going to start again. What does it mean to be restored if we're talking about the kingdom finance revolution? Does it look like what we have? And uh, I'll give you a preview. The answer is generally no. So we have this transformation, this personal transformation element, right? Personal transformation so that we become what? It says they, the, they, who are they? They are those that have gone through the personal transformation. It's not somebody jackrabbiting up saying, I'm going to be a kingdom transformer, a Christian business transformer, I'm going to do this, going to do that. No, those people will, will be called what? Oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his, his, the Lord's splendor. So it's not about you becoming a Simon the Sorcerer copy from Acts and showing yourself up as this glittering Christian that's going to come in, rich guy, transform the world, all this. No, you're going to display his splendor. If you display his splendor, you have to be displaying it in partnering with him and his works. Those works are to destroy the works of Satan. That's it. That's it at its nub. If you can't track what you're doing in life back to that, you're missing it. The second they in Isaiah 61 is what? They will then go on, or they will, rebuild the ancient ruins, restore the places long devastated, renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Brothers and sisters, we stand in the devastated ruins of our generations. Oh yes, there may be some good stuff that's come through, there may be all of this kind of stuff, but by and large we stand in the ruins of our generation, that God wants to have transformers come and restore. We've got homelessness in our cities. We've got prostitution in our cities. We've got devastation. We've got um, sexual dysphoria, misidentification of sexuality. We've got the curse of defilement. We've got poverty. We've got lack. We could go on and on. And I do sometimes show snippets of where we're at in the world because we have to know but in, in many cases, it's quite bleak. And, and those that do have money sometimes sit there in their kind of exalted positions, separating themselves from the hoi polloi, looking down their nose at those that have no ability and capability to move forward. And we talk about that a lot in the over-enrichment of the oligarchic 1%, 0.1% class with, with a separation of wealth increasingly into a small elite that want to tell us how to live and how we can live our lives. If we move through to that, Isaiah 61 goes on, I'll just skip a little bit, but it says, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance, and you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. Hey, that's where I want to be. Now, I link this to Jesus. Let's be explicit about that. Luke 4, 16 to 20. This is Jesus going home to his hometown in Nazareth. And he came to Nazareth where, Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. 
And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. So he unrolled it to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he, that's Jesus again, and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. He went on to say, this day is that fulfilled, that scripture fulfilled because he was that he. So you see the connection. We're in Jesus. Jesus has saved us. That's his ministry of transformation, personal salvation. That's where we are. That's where we sit. So there's three levels of transformation. Now, this is central to all the talks I do, central to the book on kingdom finance revolution, uh, central to everything that we're talking. What are those three levels of transformation? Well, the first one is personal. You know, I'm not really interested to hear what so-and-so is doing in terms of transformation work if they haven't gone through the first personal transformation to build kingdom. Yes, we might learn some things. There might be some interesting topics there. But I want works that I can lay before Jesus that aren't burned in the fire. I want works that he's called us to work in. We'll talk about that a little bit further on. So the first level is personal. Jesus is the gateway to kingdom finance revolution. If somebody else is doing tr city transformation and they're doing it some other way, it may be a good, a good work, but it's not transformational and it doesn't have the power to break the bondages of lack because those bondages are broken as we just saw. If there's slavery in the city, if there's a bondage operating in the city, if the enemy is at work through satanic forces in the city, those bondages are broken through Jesus. Salvation, we talk about, there's evangelists out there, we, we were all raised kind of in a church that was out for spiritual laws, witnessing, right? Salvation, which is forgiveness from sins and our eternal life. And, and I, I really, I support that, and people are called to do that sort of as their main thing, and that's fantastic. We're all called to do it to some extent, to be a witness in that way. But that is not all that there is to salvation. Right? It, it isn't just to sort of get through the fire, smoking with your hair on fire and your clothes burned off, but get into the kingdom. Salvation is about a victorious life, a victorious life. Yet many in the church are struggling, not making ends meet, not getting by, not having enough to do what God's called them to do. They're in that cycle of battle and kingdom finance revolution, the revolution is to call us up higher and see the power of God move through, to break through, to make these things happen. Why? Because God wants us to lead a victorious life. And I could go through scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. I would that you prosper even as your soul prospers. So personal transformation is about us, me, William, you, yourself. Where are you at? Right? And Jesus gave us an example of that one-on-one -on -one person with the Father transformation. He, he made it really simple for us. If we feel we're not worthy, he gave us an example of somebody who's 100% not worthy. Right? We can't earn our salvation anyway. We don't want to stray into that. But many of us say, okay, I understand we can't earn our salvation, but I'm not the person I should be. I've done this, I've done that, I've done you know this and that in my life. I've, you know, the, You're thinking about all these things you've done. I know I'm saved, but, you know, you just stop right there. You put a cap on it all, right? Jesus gave us the example of what? The prodigal son. I'm not going to take the time to read that story. Go back and read it in detail. But essentially, the prodigal son uh, connived his inheritance early and took it out and did everything wrong with it. Wild living, prostitution, all the kind of stuff that you're talking about. He blew it all. And then he ended up living with the pigs in poverty, living with the pigs in poverty. And in that culture, pigs and pig excrement, pig food was the ultimate in defilement and uncleanness. So Jesus gave an example of somebody that had blown it, was completely unacceptable, was no longer capable of being part of 
the, the existing, if you will, Christian community or covenantal community, religious community, Jewish community that he came from. 100% at fault. Read that story and see if he did anything right. He didn't even recognize his own son. He said, well, at least I know even if I'm a slave, if I sell myself into slavery in my father's household or into servant as a servant, I'll at least get some food. So he wasn't going back to say, hey, I'm, I'm your son. Remember me? I'm sorry or anything. You know, he was coming back to just be nobody. Complete destitution, complete deprivation, complete destruction, 100% at fault. And I believe Jesus did this to make sure that everybody knew that you can't add any of your own merit to anything that we're talking about, certainly when it comes to your, our one-on-one -on -one restoration through the work of Jesus in Isaiah 61. Beauty for ashes, freedom from slavery, that's for everybody 100%. And everything good that you've done doesn't even merit mention because there's no righteousness in the context of our salvation and restoration. So what does it mean then to see him restored? How was he restored? He was restored to his position as son. He was given the ring, the fatted calf, the, the clothes. Of course, they didn't put the clothes on him when he was dirty, so he would have been cleaned up. He would have been back in his position as, as a son to the extent that the existing son was, was upset at that restoration. It was so thorough and so complete and over and above and beyond all that he could ask or even think, right? That, that is restoration that we have in him. So the first thing we need to do is to rise up to that first level of restoration in our lives, in our communities now in 2024, or whenever you're listening to this, we need to be at that level raised up. Well, what does that mean? Free to serve. We're going to just send a moment to break this apart. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his what workmanship. This is through this work on Isaiah 61, right? Jesus. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, fill in the blank, no, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we have a plan in front of us for good works. We aren't just saved to lead a better life, to self-actualize so that we can do this and do that, other good things that may be, may be good, maybe not, to build our car collection, you know, to do this. No, no, no. We're not just saved for that. These things may be good. They may not, not be good. I'm not even going to talk about that. The reality is, though, we have works that he's called us to walk in. Another scripture that's incredibly relevant that we talk about is our freedom, our liberty, our restoration, this Isaiah 61 freedom into this great life that he's called us to, to be an oak of righteousness. Our freedom is to serve him. We're not freed to somehow become something else and then make decisions on our own and, and like I say, self-actualize, build a legacy. Many people are talking about building a legacy. And there's so much of this kind of generic talk in the body of Christ. Now, Jesus has called us so that we can be transformed. He's called us because he has works for us to, that he prepared for us to walk in. And Jeremiah 2.20 in the Amplified Classic says, For long ago in Egypt, our parallel for liberty, because the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and then God broke them out. For not for long ago in Egypt, I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, not so that you might be free, but that you might serve me. So let's make that modern. Um, William, I saved you. I delivered you from the sinful life you were leading into my kingdom, into my presence, because there's works for you to walk in. Not so that you could be free, but so that you could serve me. What is service? It's those works that we're called to walk in and his workmanship and his power. And again, Exodus 7, 16, 8, 1 and 8, 20, let my people go that they may serve. They may serve. Now, freedom is great. I believe in all the civil, the, um, civil stuff we have in our the constitutional talks and things like that about freedom. That's fantastic. But in the context of our relationship with God and the works for our life to walk in, it isn't about freedom. Our freedom is to serve. 
So the government pattern that allows us to be more free to serve is the government pattern we should support. If the government pattern allows us to be less free to serve, it res puts restrictions on our freedom to serve. If it puts restrictions on our prayer for those that are struggling with sexuality, then these are things we need to fight. So we very simple worldview for Christian reformers. We want to be the Isaiah 61, capital T-H-E-Y. They, the people that transform. So where are we? Let's do a status check. Poverty and lack, we talk about these things right now in the context of not just money, but mainly in terms of, of economic status and money. What do we call that? In the book, we developed the concept of the outhouse. It's an outside toilet. Right? And if you're in the bottom of it, you're standing maybe knee deep in feces and urine, that's not a very nice place to be. And the world is like that. It's full of defilement and lack. Some people can scramble up so that they got a better car and a better house and they're at the top of the outhouse and they can maybe get a fan to get some fresh air in figuratively. But it's they still carry the odor of defilement, the odor of the outhouse. Whereas Jesus says we're to come carrying the atmosphere, the aroma of heaven, the aroma. We're to be in a different kingdom building. We're not to be struggling, backstabbing, all this kind of stuff in the outhouse. How much that we see, even in the Christian church, leaders backstabbing one another, ministries undermining one another, stuff going on that's uh, absolutely crooked, leaders falling into sexual uh, uh, sins and destru destruction, 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 facades, and pharisaical whitewashes. You know, that's outhouse. God's doing something different. So we see the outhouse, we see poverty, we see lack. And I'll just give you some statistics very quickly. We go through these in more detail in, again in the book, but the un UK's unsecured debt mountain over 300 billion Right, U.S. consumer debt, this rose again to 17.6.06 trillion in 2023, probably much higher now. 80% of all the U.S. dollars in existence were printed in the last 22 months. Right, from 4 trillion in January 2020, when the current Biden regime took over, to 20 trillion in October 2021, and let's update that even closer. Government debt, 2.4 trillion in the UK, massive debt mountains in the UK. And we come out with statistics. What, what, does the, what is the impact of that statistic? The impact of that statistic is that 56% of people cannot afford a $1,000 emergency expense. Right. Another statistic I pulled, you can Google these yourself, but another statistic I pulled, and the U.S. is much more forthcoming on these, but in the U.S., it says that only 10 to 11 percent of Americans have over $2,000. Pretty shocking, that. 36 percent of Americans report they have less than $100 saved. 49 percent have 500 or less in their savings account, their ability to spend cash is what they're saying, 49%. And of course, we've talked about this at Great Lake, the Great Reset and all, all our oligarchic betters want to keep everyone in that situation, keep everyone under this poverty structure so that they can be governed easily and infantilized into some sort of uh, state control. So what we read from that is we are not doing in the church way, way, way better than the people in the world right now. Most Christians are in the out outhouse in lack and poor. Blunt. Most Christians are. A few are in the outhouse in lack, but with cash. So they're at the top of this outhouse. And we see that many times, uh, the big dog spirit in abundance. If you go to a Christian business conference, just uh, measure the ego uh, that you see or the false humility that you see. What I'm calling out is where are the Elijahs? So what do I mean by Elijah warriors or Elijahs or cultural architects? 
Elijah had an uncompromising vision of what God wanted to do. It didn't include um, collaborating with Ahab and Jezebel. He, he actually dealt with the culture, spoke to the culture. So much so that when Ahab met with him, he said, is it you that's the troubler of Israel? And um, Elijah turned it back around and said, no, you are through your sin. We want to be troublers at this level where we are affecting and impacting people around us and our culture. So that's what I mean by an Elijah. Elijah shifted culture. He had a pivotal moment with the prophets, uh, priests of Baal, where the fire of God came down and consumed his altar and the um, prophets of Baal, priests of Baal were destroyed. There was, there was change that happened in his ministry and through his life. And we want ourselves, our people, people we're bringing up, we want the 7,000 to be operating in the spirit and power of Elijah, to see the glory of God fall in power to destroy the works of Satan. So that's us. That's us personally. We need to be personally operating at a level that most of us are not operating. And, and I need to make that clarion call clear to people, because when I speak to people, many times they feel they're doing okay, they're getting by, you know, I can sort of cover things. We, you know, we got another few years before the great crisis in people's minds. Uh, I don't need to worry about the, yeah, I like got a chance to really make some bank or coin. It doesn't matter that I have all this debt, you know, blah, blah. they're in the cycle, they're in the system. I just need another win. I just need another win. I just need another win. I need something to happen to pay off my credit card. This is the cycle that people are in. So we've all been in there. And, and I think that's where the church is at. Well, God is, the revolution is calling people, a whole cadre of people to rise up to a different level of prosperity. So why? So they can serve. Children of Israel did not leave 400 years of slavery or whatever the exact amount of time was in Egypt in poverty with the, just the clothes on their back. No, they left with the plunder of Egypt for service. Right, read it. They left with the plunder of Egypt for service. God, God balanced the scales for the generations of slavery, and they left with massive plunder from Egypt um, for service. Long ago, I broke your chains, not so that you'd be free, but so that you could serve. And again, what the Christians doing? If they do have some wealth, oh, they're busy chucking it into golden calves or self-consumption or all kinds of stuff without reference even to what service might be in terms of what we're talking about. The transformed cannot begin to transform if they don't have basic levels of restoration in their life, like Jesus spoke about for the prodigal son. Do you remember? Another truism, that poverty is not solved by money. It's a curse that must be broken so that we can then operate in the blessing. We need to be operating in the blessing, fully coming out of the curse through Isaiah 61. Because why? Because the blessing makes rich and adds no sorrow. Read it the other way. Lack makes poor and brings sorrow. The curse of lack makes poor and brings sorrow. Some examples of that, I uh, watched a very interesting show on lottery winners that had won over something like 100 million, and the vast majority of them were in poverty again within five or six years. Lack makes poor and brings sorrow. So the kingdom finance revolution breaks us out personally so we can lift our eyes from our own needs, right? Lift our eyes from our own needs. We, the ecclesia, we, the church, needs to rise up corporately as individuals together so that we can see beyond our own needs, beyond our own table for food, beyond our own car that's breaking down, beyond the situations that we're in, and that we can collaboratively help each other to rise up it and be effective in this level that we're talking about, this next level. What does it look like? Right? Think about it. The Bible calls us to leave inheritances to our children and to our grandchildren. 
Uh, that's a new way of living and operating in the kingdom. You know, in the book, I postulate that uh, or, or posit that the reason people have mortgages as and they think that's an exception to the debt cycle is because the inheritances that we receive from our grandparents and our parents weren't sufficient to establish us in life so that we could operate at this level. We need to position our mind, change our mind, change our mindsets that we're going to operate at a new level personally that, that is the, the, the establishment of what it means to be the prodigal son restored. And, and we need to put some basic factors around what that looks like. And, and the next step shows us how to do that. So that's us personally. Layer one, personal. Isaiah 61, transformation, personally. What's the next example? That's one-on-one. -on -one. If, if we're established personally, then we can be in a position where I can reach out and, and help Donna, where I can reach out and help somebody else, where I can do something person to person. So this is this individual thing. And why do I do it like that? It, it's sort of, Jesus even said, you know, go to your neighbor, then go out to the farthest reaches of the world. Now, caveat on all that I'm saying don't not do things because you aren't, haven't reached this stability yet. We, we start the journey from where we are, and God knows that. Uh, so don't say, I'm not going to give to somebody, I'm not going to help somebody because I'm not rich yet. You know, I'm not rich yet. Man, I remember putting two pound, two dollars in the offering. Why? Because I wanted to participate in the blessing and in the giving cycle. And if you don't have something and you're in a key meeting and there's something really impartation being released, you know, give what you have. Right, I've given pens. <laughs> you know, give what you have because you want to participate in what's going on. So Jesus gave us an example of what this one-on-one -on -one looks like. So first you've been restored, prodigal son restored. Now you're the prodigal son living this kingdom life that you're called to walk in. And he talked about the Good Samaritan. Right? Remember the story. All the religious people walk by, everybody walk by, this guy's been beaten up, robbed, laying in a ditch. I, I call him naked in a ditch, right? Beaten and robbed. He's he, he's not going to give you anything for helping him because it looks like he's got absolutely nothing. Just let him die. And nobody wanted to touch him, but the Good Samaritan did. And what does that look like? What did the Good Samaritan do? He picked him up. He had transport there with him. He was able to treat his wounds. He was able to give him food, water, take him to a place of lodging, get doctors and nurses to come and attend to him where he, where he was, uh, pay the bills, and then say, hey, when I come back, I'll settle anything that's outstanding beyond what I've already paid for. So I, I think this is nice because it's not culturally specific. So if you're living in the equivalent of Bible times, you can add up what your horse feed is and everything else. You can calculate what that is. Nowadays, you'd say, okay, I need a car. I need to be traveling. I need to put this guy in a hotel for two weeks. Remember, this guy was away from home, so he couldn't take him home. I was traveling. So we basically take your last two weeks holiday abroad and double it and then add private doctors flying in or coming to deal with this guy and what the costs of that would be. I took a stab at it a while ago from various sources, sources and while I don't put a, a number on it in the book, I came up around 20,000 pounds is what this would cost you to help this guy. Oh, let's say I'm being wildly exaggerating. Let's cut it in half, say 10,000. Jesus said that we as believers should do this continually. Now, we can spiritualize it and say, well, he meant helping the poor, and you can help them with a cup of water. And, of course, all of that is true. But look at this one example. If we, if we are raised up as a group of people so that we're no longer just worried about our own needs and the needs of our immediate family, but we've now achieved a level of stability that God wants us to be at. And that, is, that brothers and sisters, is a revolution because it's a battle. You're drawing a bloodline in your generations for most people, and you're saying there was poverty before, but there isn't going to be poverty after. In my bloodline, it's going to be before William, before Johnny, before Donna, before who we were, and then after who we were, because we're ushering in a kingdom revolution in our personal 
life and personal situation. Kingdom revolution. Right? I think it's harder for super rich people because they've got the grand old home that their ancestors won probably through some dodgy dealings and think, how do you deal with all of that? God can still untangle it. Don't worry about it. But Jesus said it was more difficult. But for those of us that are sitting, pounding our chest, as Jesus said, woe unto me, I'm a sinner. He wants there to be a transformational shift into what he talks about throughout the entire scripture, the scripture about it, what it means to be a king and a priest, an heir and a joint heir with him. What does that look like? We all need to rise to the kingdom finance floor. I call this the floor in the book. I call it the floor because I don't want to talk about the ceiling. Um, you know, I pray that some people rise to a ceiling that I can't even imagine. We need we need some multi-billionaires. You can't be just the the ungodly billionaires funding um, horrible stuff. We need Christian releasers of wealth at the same level. So we all need to rise to this kingdom finance floor. God's called us to rise, and and I 100% declare and decree that he's given you the capability to rise to that floor level. Now, what does continually mean? I'd love to have a um, Bible scholar, Aramaic or Greek, and tell me what continually actually meant, but I'm just going to use a common word. Continually means do it all the time. So... Is that once a month, once every six months? How many people can do it once uh, a year? 20K once a year, 10K once a year. Right? Not borrowing, not putting yourself in debt. This is this is the, the level of operating that you can be a blessing and helping the poor and giving to others, helping this guy in the ditch continually. Let's move to work to where we can do that continually once a month. Well, that would be a challenge that would blow most believers' minds, right? They, they would blow their minds to think that they could be doing something at that level with free, blessed money while their own needs are met at that level. So we, we need to rise up way beyond where we are in our thinking. Why? Job 29, Isaiah 58, and Psalm 112 are the watchword scriptures of the 7,000. These are our core scriptures. Job 29, Job went out with money to find those in need that he could bless. He went out with money to find needs, uh, people he didn't know, so that, so that he could meet their needs, he, so that he could break the jaw of the oppressor, set the captives free, right? He, he was apparent to the orphans and the widows. R read Job 29. That's, that's who we want to be. Isaiah 58, you give of what sustains you. No fasting. Don't talk to me about fasting when you when you drop a 10, 10 in the offering and you, you, you don't care about stuff and we're not living the lives that we should live. That's just religious performance, right? That's just that's just learning a, a common code language of a of a of a Christian subculture. No, we want to be be transformers in our core of our being, operating at that level. Psalm 112, what? This, this giving lifestyle, lender, not a borrower, right? Add in Deuteronomy 28, the blessing, that we're, we're, we're lenders to nations, not borrowers, because we're blessed. We're blessed so much. Guess what? I've had to borrow. What is that an indication of? Is, is that a sin? Well, yeah, it's an indication of sin in my life, my generation. I'm not in the place where I needed to be financially yet, where we could be operating at this level, but we call it out. How do we call it out? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come to everybody listening here on these basic fundamentals. Basic fundamentals. We want to be engaged. What about what's next then? And this is where everybody wants to run to. They want to run to, oh, we want to be cultural transformers, I want to do this, I want to, I want to lead this ministry, I want to change this, I want to be a city transformer, and people talk, 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 talk. And you get some rich people trying to do stuff before their personal life is transformed. Their, their relationships are a mess. And people say, well, you've got to be careful when you shake their hand that you get all your fingers back. They've got horrible reputations. Their lives aren't in order. 
but they're out trying to do stuff like crazy at the top level. And I'm, I'm telling you right now that we're in a season where God is not going to allow that kind of mixed waters, mixed anointing. Simon the sorcerer, uh, you know, I, I love that scripture. Somebody put it in front of me, and I, I'm using it quite a bit. Why? Because we cannot be people that ape, ape, copy the genuine that's out there. But we have to have fire on our altars. We have to call for the fire. Now, you may be Joseph in prison. It doesn't mean you aren't exactly where you need to be to be broken through to where God has you. You may have an amazing anointing, but not have cash in the bank. You may be like David on the run in a cave. But guess what? If you're David in a cave about to be king, you're not a caveman. We cannot take on the identity of the battle that the enemy has, has put us in contending for our spiritual and miracle breakthrough. And, you know, I had a chastisement on that myself personally when I was taking the offering the other day because I was thinking about thinking about money coming and I slipped into the mindset that somehow we were getting money from people into the uh, offering I was taking at a prophetic meeting. And uh, God corrected me and, and said, you, you remember that Elijah asked the widow for a, an offering, asked her for food, Right, but the but Jesus recorded that widow of Zarephath story as Elijah being sent to bless the widow. History records it that that it wasn't him as a poor person, if you will, just coming in out of the wilderness with nothing, starving. The the blessing was the other way around, the the other way around, and that's how we need to start to see things with the different kingdom mindset. I haven't even got into the map and the territory. We may talk about that just briefly. So what about this then? I've talked about it before. I'll maybe have another session on the 7,000 vision of transformation. We, we want to see this amazing stuff. Think tanks. We want to have all this stuff, these ideas. How do we get there? Personal transformation. Then transformation so that we can be operating one-to-one -one as Jesus called us to do as the Good Samaritan. And then secondly, we can go out then and do what? Isaiah 61, start to transform the ruins of our generation. And how do we do that? We have to be cultural transformers in the 14 gates. 14 gates. A gate is a place of ingress and egress. I don't have time to do the full teaching on the 14 gates, but we will break this apart in minutia over the next year place of egress and ingress, coming and going. These are the pivotal points for the battle of culture. Elijah brought the prophets of Baal to two altars for a showdown, right? A, a, a showdown. That's that's the concept of a gate, right? What are, what are some of these issues that we're facing now? Genesis is, is a great example. God, God made the world... He made male and female, talked about children, talked about dominion. Every single one of those things, most of the left wing and many of the right wing parties are contending against as being incorrect. Male and female is under attack. God is under attack. Children are under attack. Dominion, our role in the world, is under attack. Matter of fact, many people want to see a mass extinction level event of humanity to try and save the Gaia world. I mean, there's some weird stuff going on, and we talk about that from time to time um, on this channel. Cultural battles. Where these cultural battles exist, we all have to raise a righteous standard, but some of us are called to particular battle places. Some people are called to particular spheres of influence to fight these battles to raise a righteous standard. And make no mistake, righteous standard is a requirement to, to, for us to raise. We can either do it in a time of battle where we get good leadership around us, or you can do it under the reign of a, somebody like a Hitler, where, as Bonhoeffer said, we should have done this earlier, his raising a righteous standard resulted in his martyrdom. Stephen's raising a righteous standard resulted in his martyrdom. We have to raise them anyway. So why let the culture be destroyed that we're talking about? So what are these seven gates of culture. Some people, I think, call them seven mountains. 
media and entertainment, people postulate as one, government sphere, educational sphere, the economy is another, business, religion is another, and, and celebration, entertainment, that's the media concept, and family. So we need to be occupying all of these, so these division of human endeavor that we've split into these sort of main spheres of influence. And why do I say 14? Because guess what? Above them in the heavenlies, there's the cor corresponding seven. God has a position on family. So God's gate on family is here. The earthly gate has shifted further and further. When you see 50-some-year-old men twerking in front of a, of a seven-year-old boy and the parents standing by clapping, you know that that family gate on the bottom has shifted well beyond acceptability. And we need to raise righteous standards at these gates. There's battle to be raised at these gates, not to establish a theocracy, that's not what we're talking about, but to establish that freedom where we can operate in kingdom values with less constraint, right? And people say, oh, you shouldn't be political. Guess what? John the Baptist lost his head because he challenged the sexual immorality of the king of his day. Right? He challenged the sexual immorality of the king of his day. We need to be engaged in these battles of culture, and that's what we do to some extent on this channel when we raise some of these issues that we're talking about. And these battles are across the, the piste. I called it the Omni cause. We have all of this information. Why do I go through some of this basic stuff? Because if you talk to the average Ecclesia member living in poverty, wondering what's going on, they don't have any idea. They don't have any idea. We need to be the sons of Issachar that can show them where we're going. You know, as the prophet Veronica West has said, the anointing of Shammah, the mighty men of David, and this is from 2 Samuel 23, 12. He was standing in the lentil field. He took his stand, it says, in the middle of the field. He, Shammah, took his stand. What do I mean? He took a stand. He raised a righteous standard. He said, this isn't going to happen. He defended it, and he struck the Philistines down. Why? And the Lord brought, a, brought about a great victory. If we stand and raise a righteous standard in the middle of the field that God has placed us in, the works we're called to walk in, the Lord will meet us and bring about a great victory. Guess what? I cannot tell you how to raise up from personal breakthrough level into this next level and into the next level. I can't. I can't tell. There, there's probably good people out there that can say, do this, do that, savings plans and all this kind of stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow. It's a revolution. If we press into God, God is going to break us through. Why? Because his word says it and his word cannot be denied. If we raise our standard and say the Abraham family, every put your own name here, this family was raising a righteous standard in the middle of our lentil field against all the Philistines that are trying to keep us back and keep us in poverty. God is going to give you the victory in the name of Jesus. God moves heaven and earth to bring about fulfillment of his promises. Courage is contagious. We need that word activated. We need them to operate in faith on the word vision that God gives us and action. And that vision is going to be crazy sometimes. Right? Gideon had to send back the bulk of his army when he was going into a battle. Our eyes need to be open to the spirit realm. That's the different map I was talking about. So that we see him as our vital and urgent necessity. Let's just read 2 Kings 6, 17 again. Then Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. He's talking about his servant. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Why? Because Elisha was in his field holding up the righteous standard. Guess what, brothers and sisters? I am standing in my field. I'm raising a righteous standard. I'm declaring the covenant of God over my life and over the life of my family. 
And God is doing what? There's a mountain full of horses and chariots of fire all around me. When you stand, there is a mountain full of horses and chariots of fire around you. There's a battle presence around us above and beyond all that we can ask or even think. Above and beyond all that we can ask or think. Our map, our, our, our viewpoint, our worldview needs to include this. James 5.16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Avails much. I'm praying for each of us, each of you right now to break through into the financial plan so that you can operate in the works and kingdom that God's called you to be in the name of Jesus. James 5.16 seals that. Because a righteous man, my prayer is going to avail much in my life and in yours. Ephesians 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not about this natural world that we see, the money in our bank account, this and that and the other thing. What's keeping us in lack? What's keeping people blinded to lack? What's keep, keeping people sleeping and slumbering in this strange altar world that the enemy is trying to take us into, a build back better and the great reset, floating on the barge with Jezebel, listening to the lullaby of Delilah, putting us to sleep, sucking some kind of secular dummy in our soother or pacifier in our mouth. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So who do we need to be in that battle? We need to be people that plant our feet with spikes in the ground, and we say we are planted in the field that God has given us. We are breaking through Isaiah 61 personally. We're breaking through. Jesus commanded us to be the Good Samaritan continually. He wouldn't command you to be the Good Samaritan continually if he didn't empower you to be the Good Samaritan continually. And then beyond that, just helping one person, we want to be people that have works and callings <clears throat> to transform our culture. We want to be Elijah's in the land, cultural architects, transformers of culture. We want to see our nations change, the ruins of our generation. And that requires money. That requires resource. That requires us to be bro broken through into new levels we don't understand. And God will do it in ways we can't imagine, ways we can't imagine. Let this mind be in you, Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things of earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? That is the mindset that we have to have. So when I talk, and we break this down in great detail in the book, it's almost 300 pages, but I wanted to do a rattle skip through the entire thing so that we understand the direction and the whole scope and vision of what we're talking about. We want to release a movement, a breakthrough movement of Elijah's uh, 7,000 reverse tithers that are, that are radical givers that are going out there to destroy dominions, transform cultures. We start by personal transformation. You know, when I first ran out to do it, I got the vision of all this. And of course, I give myself some grace. You have to start from where you were. But I liken it to running naked from the tent with a toothbrush and attacking the enemy because we didn't have any idea. There was no apostolic and prophetic support. There were no intercessors. There were no core givers that were supporting us in our vision for what we needed to do. And I call out all of that right now in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, to move forward to build a vision that, that I can't even begin to think how we could accomplish it. Why? Because that's what God's put on my heart to do. That's what we've had prophetically endorsed over and over again. That's what we paid the price for to move forward in our life. That's why William Abraham had to change, had to change dramatically from the person I was even 10 years ago. Had to change. Why? Because we need to be people on whom the glory of God can rest. We need to be people that can bring the atmosphere of heaven into the places where we're going. We need to see more clearly. We need to see and understand more clearly. We need to move into levels we just can't imagine and just can't believe. And we're going to do it. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak to each person that's watching this live and each person that listens to this um, after the fact. 
that they would move into a new level of understanding, that they would begin to have, the, that they would first have the mental blindness, this Deuteronomy 28, 29 blindness, where they can't see uh, because of the curse. They can't see the issues. That there would be vision to see that we are not where we need to be. We, our communities are not where we need to be. God didn't create communities of poverty. I spoke to a fellow, this is an aside to the prayer, who works with a particular community. Um, and he said what he realizes is that the enemy has been at work for so many generations in that community that when people get saved, generally they don't really speak well. They don't have any education. They've been raised with hate and violence, and they don't have any skills that and their parents probably haven't had any skills that would merit them really leading a productive life. And he's saying, how how is God going to bring transformation into these societies and these territories, these lands where he's moving? But God can. God can transform it because of the power of his spirit, because of the power of his passion to restore people first as individuals to where he needs them to be, and then start restoring the generation, the generations. And that was done in the West. We repent for the stuff that was done wrong, but what was done right was there were generations of service. There were generations that contended against slavery. There were generations that contended to build up economic models where people could earn money and things. That There were generations where God was leading people in righteousness and in right paths. And we need to be those people again. We need to be those people again. So to finish the prayer, God is releasing you to understand where you need to be, and then he's going to release the blessing that makes rich to make that happen. And we shut down every curse in operation in people's lives generationally and personally. We curse lack, or we curse debt, we curse the cultures that have held people into bondage. And Father, for those people that right now that are struggling with particular timely issues, I pray that there would be a breakthrough release a breakthrough uh, understanding, a practical breakthrough of money, food, whatever it might be that they're looking for. Why? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We ask this in your name, for your glory. Amen.